Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> I'm Apostle T.B. Walker. want to take this time to welcome you once again to our Thursday evening Bible study. Certainly glad to have you here with us today. And uh, certainly want to make sure that I just remind you always to share the video. But I want you to really, really uh, just kind of buckle in today and really get into what the Word of God is actually saying. This is our Bible study. Uh, we're able to kind of break, we're here to break down the Word, to really see how that Word applies to our life. Uh, and also, you know, want to make sure that you recognize that we're interactive. If you've got comments, uh, place those in the comments. If you've got questions, make sure you uh, put, place those questions in the comments, and we'll answer those questions in real time. So certainly, again, I'm, I'm glad to have you here. Let's get directly into the Word. I'm going to be reading today out of the book of Zechariah, chapter number 3. And I'm just going to read verses 1 through 3. That's Zechariah, chapter number 3. It's verses 1 through 3. And I'm going to read this one out of the ESV version. You can read any version that you want, but just make sure that you are attentive here because I think there's something that you really want to pick up here that I think you're going to be able to apply. It's going to be a blessing to you today. So let's get into the Word. Hi, Mom. And it reads, Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at the right hand, at his right hand, to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked out from the fire? Last verse. Now Joshua was standing before the angel, clothed with filthy garments. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we just thank you once again for this gathering, for those that are here. For those that are coming on, those that are going to hear this at whatever time they hear it, God, we just thank you right now for the anointing that is in your word, the anointing that is timeless, that no matter if this the word is heard today, it's going to be anointed because it is from you. If that word is heard next week, it's going to be anointed because it's from you. The, the anointing that is upon your word and your uh, upon your promises will never change, will never wane, and will never waver. So, Lord, our faith, we pray right now, will not wane, will not waver. And we bless you right now for what you're doing in this place of revelation and that you're giving us so that we will be able to walk circumspectly before you. We thank you for all that you've done in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we've got a vision here uh, that's, that that uh, is being given now to Zechariah. It says, he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand. Now, you know, this, this uh, there's a vision here that Zechariah gets. And he sees the high priest who is the high priest at that time. This is a, a man by the name of Joshua. Now, this is not Joshua, the son of Nun, who uh, was Moses' assistant, who would later usher the children into the promised land. This is not that Joshua. This is Joshua, the son of uh, Jehozadak, uh, who was a prophet, uh, who was actually a priest himself in Babylon. Uh, he died in Babylon. So when we look at this Joshua, he is the first high priest uh, for the exiles that have come back, uh, in, you know, in captivity or from the captivity. He's the first high priest in the land. And so he is at this point, the high priest, when they are Judas trying to rebuild the temple, they're rebuilding the wall, they're rebuilding the nation, basically. They're coming back and they're doing nation building. So when you begin to look at this, uh, Joshua here is a representative of the priesthood. He's a representative of the people. He's actually a representative of the whole nation as he is standing here, uh, the Bible says, before the Lord. And Satan is at, right there on his right hand. Now, you know, in this vision that you see here, you see uh, that, that's given to Zechariah, the high priest is standing in the presence of the Lord, but he's clothed in these filthy garments. And what you find out is that, the, you know, when Zechariah enters into uh, this vision, uh, it, there's a trial that's basically going on. When you begin to look at this, uh, you, you'll see the characters here. Uh, you know, the angel of the Lord is there. You know, the Lord is here. Um, we re recognize that Zechariah is watching here and Joshua standing there and Satan is also there. So, you know, we've got a court setting here and the trial here of Joshua and Israel is actually in progress as Zephaniah is getting this vision and he's permitted you know, to enter into the courtroom. This is closed to everybody else. They don't know what's going on. In the same way we're allowed to enter into the courtroom, um, well, you know, the behind-the-scenes actions that's going on with Job. You know, when the, angel, uh, the, the angels are coming to present themselves before God, and we find out that there's this conversation that goes on behind the scenes. You know, have you tried my servant Job? All those things that's happening with Job, we find out here, Zechariah is getting a, you know, front-row seat to, you know, the, the, the court proceedings. Now, we don't hear, you know, the case that's brought against Joshua uh, by Satan. We don't hear the, um, you know, any, any defense 
that's that's there. We don't hear the pleadings of both sides of the case. We don't get any of that. But what we do hear is the sentencing. We get the sentencing here, and we recognize that you know that Jesus here passes a sentence. So you know this one is Joshua standing in the presence of the Lord, but he's not standing here as a penitent. He's not standing here as one who is actually, even though it's a court proceeding. Uh, you know, he's standing before the Lord, ministering. He stands as a minister. He has not lost his place. He's not stripped of any of his, um, you know, his, his authority or his garments, and, which is, again, one of the things that Satan is railing against because here this man is standing before the Lord when he should be, in Satan's eyes, dragged before the court. He should be thrown in front of the court, begging for mercy. Yet he's standing in front of the Lord, and he's clothed yet in these filthy garments. So, we know that Joshua isn't standing before the Lord as a spectator. He's actually ministering. He's actually standing as a ministering priest. And the Bible tells us here that Satan is on his right hand. So we've got the angel of the Lord on his left. We've got uh, Joshua just standing there. And then we've got on the right side, we've got Satan standing on his right hand. But the scripture says to oppose him. So... We've got this great adversary that's, you know, we're getting his name here, uh, Satan. And, and it's a proper name because it assumes the character of Satan, which is an accuser of the brethren. He is in this trial, the accuser. He's bringing accusation against uh, Joshua. He's bringing accusation against the people, the whole nation. So we see that the setting is one that is judicial. Now, so now he comes forward, you know, as, as a complete enemy. There's, there's no thought that he is here, you know, speaking on Joshua's behalf. No way. He is here to accuse him in his capacity as a priest. You know, he's, he's, you know Joshua's coming and he's got these filthy garments on, uh, you know, and he recognizes that there's sin here. I mean, he's been watching this. You know, Satan is as a, he's an adversary. He's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So we know that evil is ever present. And so we know how Satan recognizes and knows what, how God sees sin. And so Satan sees sin. He sees sin in the man. He sees sin in the priesthood. He sees sin. He knows what sin is. You know, he creates it. He's, he's the one who ushers it in, but he knows what it is. So as he's watching the priest uh, operate, he sees sin there. As he's watching Joshua in his own life, in his everyday life, he sees sin there. And he recognizes that just as, you know, we know that sin is an impediment to the promises of God. That they, sin has got to be dealt with in order for the promises to begin to flow and to manifest itself. Here's the thing. Sin has to actually be put away in order for the promises to manifest. And Satan is aware of this. So when he looks at this, when, when, you, when you begin to see here, you'll see here that Satan is making a declaration. Uh, you know, he's making a declaration against those who dwell in Jerusalem. He's making a declaration, uh, you know, against even God coming to Jerusalem. You know, there was a promise that the Lord had already wrote, written, and he spoke to the prophets that he was going to come back to Jerusalem and dwell in Jerusalem and visit the people and be among the people. I'll be your God. You'll be my people. And that he promises a purity. Well, you know, I mean, God's not going to come into this unclean place. He's not going to come into this unclean temple. Satan is looking in. He's rubbing his hands together because he's got an ironclad case. You know, he's a prosecutor here where he knows that what's the defense attorney going to say? I mean, he's caught red handed. His garments are dirty. He's like, he, he, can't, he had the nerve to come to court looking like he's looking right now. This is an open and shut case. And so, you know, in order for the people, he knows about the purity of God. He recognizes who God is. So he knows God, God, in order for God to come and to fulfill this promise and to dwell with the people, the people would need to be pure. And the people would need to be fit for the presence of God, they would need to be fit for the favor of God. And Satan looks and says, I see right now, these people are not fit for the promise. They're not fit for the favor. Uh, th there's no way that people can be holy. They, they, in order for them to be holy, they're going to need a holy priest who's going to teach them the ways of righteousness. That's the way of God. Well, you know, Satan has watched this as well. So when you begin to look at this, he's looking and saying, ah, this is a moment to foil my plan. God's people are out of whack. I see sin in the ministry. I see sin in the priesthood. The, the, you know, everything is going astray as priests, as people. So when you look at this situation, there's an opposition here. There's an attack uh, that's going on. And he, you know, there's a realization that in order to even like effectively intercede here, 
there's got to be some legal basis. There's nothing in this case that, you know, what can God do? <coughs> Joshua's manifested. The people have already done it. You know, there's some issues that are already there. The prophets are coming and telling, uh, talking to the people about the rebuilding. And they're not building. They're lazy. And, you know, they're, they're disobedient. So all of these things are there. And Satan has come in and has declared Joshua guilty. With all the things he's come, you know, this is kind of a closing argument where he's saying, you know, Your Honor, I mean, just look at how he's dressed today. You know, he calls himself a priest. And look at the robes that he's wearing. They're filthy. They're stained with all manner of things. He, he, Your Honor, he's got to be guilty. Guilty. You know, I'm going to rest my case here. because I, but, I, but I know you're going to find him guilty because these outward um, signs that are here, uh, in my mind at least, they, they symbolize what's going on inwardly. You know, as I see what's going on outwardly, this must be what's going on inwardly. And so Satan here looks and says, there is no remedy for this. You know, there's no way to fix this. There's no way, based upon the standard of righteousness that I know, based upon what I've seen with you, God, there is absolutely no remedy for this guy. He's got to go. And so when you begin to look at this, you know, Satan desires that he looks for that day. You know, Scripture says, let him that is filthy be filthy still, right? Satan is looking for that day. He said, today's the day. Listen, all is lost. But we find out all is not lost here. This is an amazing group of scriptures. There's just, you know, just three here. But it's amazing because Satan is looking to resist the work. And I want you to begin to grab hold of what's going on behind the scenes in your life is the same thing that's going on right now. Satan is appearing in what looks like a, 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 a place of strength. You know, Satan is on the right hand. He's on the right side. Satan looks like he's on the strong side. He's, you know, we talk about God's strong right hand. That right side is where strength and power and authority is. It's where Satan is standing in a place of strength and power and authority. Might makes right. Satan has might. And he feels like he also this time has right. I've got your track record. I've got your background. We've done all the, the, you know, every bit of investigation, uh, of the investigative work that we need. You are clearly guilty. So, you know, I want you to understand, Satan is trying to resist the work of God. And not only with Joshua, uh, not only was he showing Zechariah that very same thing, but that's what God is trying to show us today. That Satan is out there as a roaring lion doing what? He's trying to draw me into sin. Yeah, true. But I need you to understand what Satan's real role is. His role is to stop the work of God. He's trying to thwart the work of God, the plan that God has in the earth, and also the plan that God has for you. You know, this is an intimate situation because the priest is selected here by God. So the idea that Satan is able to take God's man, throw him before God, take him before the court, get an audience before the court, and pre present his case, and with garments that are clearly there, surely Satan has a victory here. You know, he desires to stop the work that you desire to do. He desires to stop the work that you're called to do. And I want you to understand, here's what's actually said here. In verse number two, and it says, And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Now, I want you to get this, because this is really important. You know, you remember here in the book of Jude, where Michael is uh, disputing over the body of Moses. Now, you know, it appears that maybe Satan wants to desecrate his corpse. He wants to use the corpse and parade it around. And we don't know what Satan wants to do, but we know that Satan desires to have the body of Moses. He wants to do something with it. Michael disputes over that. He's this, he, Michael's not going to let it happen. But the scripture said, the first thing that the scripture says is that he, Michael didn't bring any railing accusations against Satan. Right. Michael doesn't come and like, I'm going to go toe to toe for you, you with you. You know, he doesn't come and say, you old filthy, dirty devil. You know, he doesn't come and, and you know, bring any rebukes that emanate from him. He doesn't stand in authority over Satan. Right. He has authority, but the authority is not his. Michael doesn't say, I rebuke you. Michael doesn't even say, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. No, he doesn't say that. Here's what Michael says. And here's what is spoken here to Zechariah. The Lord rebukes you. The angel of the Lord is standing before Satan. I don't want you to get that. And, and what he's trying to do, he's preventing. And he's not trying to do it. He's doing this right now. And I want you to get this. As Satan looks like he's in a position of power, here the angel of the Lord is just standing there. But I want you to understand, he's preventing Satan from going any further. What is Satan? Satan is an accuser of the brother, brethren. But he's not a judge. 
Satan is the accuser of the brethren. He can bring the paperwork. He can bring the accusation. You know, he can bring every witness he wants to. But Satan is not the judge. Satan is not the judge. He's not your defense attorney. We've not even seen your case. You know, when you begin to look at, uh, you know, we used to look at trial TV all the time. And I'll tell you, those first couple days, man, they could throw you for a loop because all you heard at first was the, uh, you know, you, you would hear sometimes the prosecution's, uh, you know, case. You know, and after two or three days of hearing the prosecution's case, you walked away saying, man, I mean, that's, he's done. You know what I mean? What, what do you think he's going to get? And you people start racking up numbers already because they it's pretty much, he's already done. But, you know, interestingly enough, you didn't hear the defense attorney's case. You know, there's some things now the defense will bring out that will change everything. And now, all of a sudden, in that, that day after, now that you heard the defense attorney, you sit back saying, whoa, I hadn't thought about that. You know, I didn't know about this. And in this case, Satan is trying to advance. And he let's take this right now to sentencing. You know, the guilt is obvious. You know, all you have to do is just bang the gavel. And let's take this to sentencing and kick this dude out. Because he's not worthy to be a high priest. These people are not worthy to be called your people. And I'd like for them to be thrown into the abyss, please, sir. You know, what we are, what we are asking for is a death penalty. For these people, because the wages of sin is death, right? That's what you say, Judge. That's your standard, right? So they should get death. But let me tell you something. God does. He allows Satan to harass his people sometimes. You know, God allows Satan to actually, um, you know, fight against his people and attack his people sometimes. But he strictly regulates what Satan is allowed to do. He regulates how far Satan could go. You, you remember that, you know, the Bible comes and he tells us about Peter. And he says, Simon, I want, you to, I want to tell you something. Satan desires to have you as sift you as wheat. But I've already prayed that your faith not fail. I've already regulated it to such an extent that Satan cannot win. There are certain battles that it may look like he can win. But I want you to understand, I'm not going to allow Satan to carry out every evil intention he has against you. There's something that's going to happen. You're going to deny me three times. That's what Jesus said. But I, here's what I'm not going to let him do. He's not going to take your faith. He wants to sift you as wheat, but I've already established your faith. And so it cannot fail. So, you know, long before Satan can accuse us, and I want you to get this. Satan makes this accusation. And we go right to the sentencing. We don't hear any serious defense, right? We don't hear, you know, well, now, Your Honor, we've got to think about, you know, there's some mitigating circumstances. You know, Joshua grew up in a, in a, in a tough neighborhood. He grew up in a, in, a, in a bad home. No, there's no defense. Yeah, he's in filthy garments. I mean, that, that's guaranteed. Yes, there's sin there. Yeah, absolutely. That is guaranteed. But the plea is already in before the court case started. The plea of not guilty was already in. The plea was accepted by the defense attorney already. The defense attorney being Jesus, who is, you know, our advocate, has already put in a motion for the uh, for every tr thing that the Satan has said to be overturned. And that no matter what is said, no matter what accusation, uh, he's going to get a not guilty verdict. There's been some work done behind the scenes before any accusation gets there. Because you know what's so crazy about the accusation is that Satan has evidence. He has evidence. Joshua did what they said. Joshua is living like they said. Listen, Joshua has sin in his life. That's true. He's not perfect. That's true. The people of Israel are like off the chain. No doubt about it. That's true. They were supposed to be building and they're not. That is true. And so with all these accusations, there is a greater truth that's greater than any of those truths, which is if God be for you, who can be against you? When you begin to look at this, Satan is silenced by the plea that's already in. You know what? Uh, the Lord rebukes you. You know, be quiet. You don't have anything else to say here. You know, listen, I've heard your accusation. This would not be a court if I had not heard your accusation already. And so you've gotten a chance to give your accusation. This is what we're seeing right now is a model for spiritual warfare. That we battle against Satan on with God's authority. Not with our authority. You know, I rebuke you right now in the name of Jesus. You know, I've got this power. No, listen, do you understand something? Joshua was a high priest. He had power but not enough power to outrun the accusation that he's walking around right now in filthy garments. He's walking around right now in stained clothes. There's nothing he can say about it. If he looked down at himself and said, you know, you're, I'm, I'm not guilty. I didn't do that. I mean, you know, Satan, all Satan has to say is look at your clothes. Your clothes will tell you where you've been. Our clothes tell you what you've been through. 
the, 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 the way your garments are, are looking tells us how much you actually can make yourself clean. You are not clean, brother. And here's what Jesus comes in and he shows us the, the model for warfare. Satan, the Lord rebukes you. I'm not clean based upon my own righteousness. I'm clean because he said so. So I'm simply saying be silent and hear him because he has already said not guilty. You're wasting your time trying to, literally trying to bring me down. You know, he comes back and says, the Lord who's chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Listen, this is re reinforcing the importance of Jerusalem in the eyes of God. Listen, th more importantly, this is showing the importance of you in the eyes of God. That all that's done, he says, listen, I've chosen Jerusalem. You mean like the same people who are doing what they're doing right now who are disobedient? Yes, I've chosen them. And listen, there's no accusation you can bring that can unchoose them. There's nothing you can do that can move me out of the place of loving them. Listen, he, in Zechariah, he calls this the holy land. You know, so he says, this is my land. And I picked them before they messed up. I picked them before they had done anything good or anything bad. They were chosen before the foundation of the world, and I don't roll like that. I'm not turning around, you know, on my back on them. I'm doing the work I've promised to do to fix them, to get them right. My chosen people are special to me because I've chosen to bless them in spite of them. I picked them for reasons they will never understand on this earth. They're rational reasons. They make sense, but they're not revealed to them. It's called grace and favor. And there's and there's no way. I'll reveal it at the last day. You'll be shocked because I'm sure you're shocked now that I picked them. I saw the garments that you saw. I saw the sin that you see, but I've got a plan that you know nothing about. I alone know the thoughts I think toward you. This is God saying, listen, Satan doesn't know what I'm planning to do with you. Satan can only accuse you, but he has no idea what my plan is for you. He can conjecture. He can he can, he can can actually uh, try to project what he thinks uh, that my plan is for you. But he has no idea what I'm planning for you. And nor do you know that I'm standing up for you behind the scenes. And I want you to get that. God is standing up for you. Matter of fact, here's what he says. He says, is not this a brand plucked from the fire. You, you know what a brand is? A, a brand, you know, there, there's a, a cattle brand, right? Where you put the brand, you know, you put a brand in and you, you, you sear the cattle. This is not, that's not a brand in, in terms of the Old Testament. It, it is like a, it, it's a burning piece of wood. It's a, it's like, it's a, it's coal. You know, when you look at an old fire, uh, you know, they put out the fire. You can still, still see some of the coals burning and, and those little embers, those, the, those dark spots that have been burned to, uselessness at this point are is what a brand is that's that's what the, the, that that piece of coal that that burning piece is it's what a brand is and so the lord says is not he a brand plucked from the fire right he is plucked out of the fire i plucked him out wait a minute he was burning when i met him He's not burning anymore because I plucked him out. Do you know there's a reality here that just because Satan sees the smolderings, because he sees the blackness of the smoke, because it doesn't look like a useful piece of wood, this is God say, I picked him. Listen, he is picked. I get it. You are saying he's a smoldering piece of wood. You're right. Is not this that smoldering piece, piece of wood that I picked? Does that mean anything when I pick it? I chose it while it was on fire. I chose it while it was burning up and it was hot and going through the, the motions and going through all the tasks. But now he's out. Joshua, the high priest, is in a place of high standing before me. And I've got a plan to do something with those garments. Listen, I want you to understand something. Satan is on the right hand, but there's a protection Right there on the left, the angel of the Lord. I'm here to protect you from any of the accusations of Satan. I don't want him to allow his accusations to become any kind of reality. Listen, I believe we have a question here. Yes, good evening, Apostle. Yes, good evening. I have heard people say things like, Satan must know I am about to get blessed. That's why he is acting a mess. Can Satan see into our future? No, Satan cannot see into our future. Satan simply knows God. He simply knows humanity. Remember, he has been here since the beginning. So he doesn't know our future, but Satan definitely understands 
how God operates. Satan understands favor. You know, he doesn't understand God's full operation. Nobody does. But he has seen this with his own hand, our own eyes. Remember, because of where he was and where he was with the Lord even before he becomes Satan while he's Lucifer. So, no, he doesn't know what's going to happen. But this conversation is happening with the believer continuously. Listen, does God know? Does Satan know what's going on with Job? He doesn't know Job's future, but behind the scenes, remember, he knows how God sees uh, Job because of conversations that are being had that we don't know about, that God is talking about us in, in the spiritual realm we don't, are not aware of. So Satan does not know our future. Satan is constantly, he's an, he's an accuser of the brother brethren. So Satan is not attacking you because you're about to be blessed. Satan's attacking you continuously, consistently, because you are in the image of God. And his desire is to mar and to scratch the very image of God. And because he cannot touch God, he's coming to uh, touch you. Listen, if Satan's attacks only came when we were about to get blessed, uh, then people who had no money would never get attacked. People who had lost everything would never get attacked, right? People who were sick would never get attacked. I mean, they, 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 obviously that's a satanic attack, but they, you know, other than that, there would never be any kind of Satan say, I'm going to leave you alone. No, he's attacking us because of who we are in Christ. That's why he attacks us. So, no, he doesn't know we're about to get blessed. He doesn't know what God is going to do. He's as surprised that God is blessing us even. Uh, you know, because remember, look at his nature here. He looks and says, my view of righteousness does not encompass grace. My view of righteousness is legal. It is based upon law. And your law says, so he's not even aware. He can't even comprehend the grace of God. He's just constantly fighting you every single day. Whether you receive, when you receive that blessing, Satan is right there. He's going to try to take it. So he, this adversary is ever present and he never stops no matter whether you are in a season of chastisement where you're 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 in a season of a correction he's still going to be there to try to beat you down so no satan does not know we don't want to give him uh any kind of power to know the future because that's that's left only to god now so i want you to get this and hopefully that helps that question but um i want you to really understand here look at joshua and i think it's important to really be able to see where joshua is joshua has moved you know, with every accusation, Joshua has moved. Joshua is still standing as a high priest. With the truth wrapped up, your garments are filthy, brother. I picked you based upon things that have nothing to do with the garments. I mean, my, that my picking of you, my choosing of you, had nothing to do with whether you were going to do this or that. Whatever he's accusing you of, you could actually have done it. But my choosing you is not based upon your goodness. I never picked you because I thought that you'd keep your clothes clean. I never picked you because I thought that somehow you would go out there with your church clothes and make sure you could play and they would never get dirty. No, I knew you wouldn't get dirty. I rescued you as a brand. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? You don't understand the reason why he's so dirty. He's been rescued. That's why. He's still got the stains of his life. He's still got the stains of things on there. But look at him. He's standing in my presence and I've allowed it. I've allowed him to do it. I allow you to be here only because I want him to see how blessed he is. The only reason why Satan is there is to be able to show up and for God to say, now in spite of everything he said and even the evidence he brought, there is evidence of love he knows nothing about that covers a multitude of sin. Joshua, you are covered. I have rescued you. Satan has a lot to accuse Joshua of, and Satan could be right. But there is a greater advocate here that, that, that's bigger than any of Satan's you're right. It is God being right. I'm a, he's a greater advocate for us than Satan can be against us. If God be for us, who? What power does Satan have? And so our last verse here says, Now Joshua was standing for the angel clothed with filthy garments. This is what Satan saw. This is what Joshua saw. He saw himself. Man, you know, it's crazy sometimes, you know, how God will use Satan to show you you. All right? God uses Satan to show you you. And God uses Satan to show you him. Right? To show you God. I saw what he did. I heard what he said. You saw it. You see it yourself. And yet, I'm blessing you. You, you see it yourself, and I've not told you get out of here. I've never told you strip those garments off and run out of here. You are no longer going to be my high priest. No, I'm going to keep you standing in your place. Listen, I want you to understand, your standing with me is assured no matter what that guy over there said. 
And I have the ability to change your garments in front of Satan. Listen, next week, that's what we're going to see. We're going to recognize what, why God allows it. Why are you going to let Satan? Because I want him to see the change of clothes right in front. I want him to see that all hope is not lost. I want him to throw you in front of the court and say, this guy is done. It's, it's over. It's a wrap. You know, he, 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 you know, stick a fork in him. You know, he's finished. And I want him to see the change of clothes. You know, isn't it amazing, God says, that I set a table before you in the presence of your enemies, right? I want your enemies, those who accused you, they're going to see what I can do with a guy like you. They, I want them to see, when I put my hands to something, how I'm able to cleanse all unrighteousness. So when you begin to look at this, you don't see Joshua open his mouth. You don't see Joshua confessing. You know, you see right now Joshua coming before the Lord with filthy garments. And these filthy garments represent human righteousness. It represents his own righteousness. Jeremiah says it, I think, best. He says, our righteousness is as filthy rags, right? The filthy garment. That's what you were seeing right here. This righteousness, this, this self-representation. This is a representation of personal righteousness. Joshua's coming with his own righteousness. And guess what? It doesn't measure up. Israel has its own righteousness. It doesn't, it doesn't match, match up. We sometimes walk in our own righteousness. We create these ideas of what is good and what's sweet and what's nice. And though all those things that we kind of think, we create our own righteousness. And by ourselves, we kind of look and say, now I'm good. You know, I'm a good person. I'm really a nice person. I bet you Joshua would have thought, the work I'm doing, the ministry I'm doing, I'm a, I'm a good person. But listen, when you begin to look at this, Joshua is now, it's what's being exposed here is that Joshua's garments are dirty. What's being exposed here is that Joshua needs to be fixed. What's being exposed here is that Joshua needs a makeover. Whoa, what an awesome thing that Satan has come in and all these accusations are just pointing out the new things that God's about to do. Satan is like, look at those clothes. And God's like, awesome, what else? And look at his shoes. And God's like, awesome, what else? And look at his pocket. He ain't got no money in there. God's like, awesome, what else? And he's dragging in his sick. And God's like, what else? Well, that's all I got. And God says, okay, cool. Let's start with those garments. I'm about to give you something new. Cool. Let's start with those shoes. I'm about to give you something new. Cool. Let's start with your attitude. I'm about to give you something new. And let's start with your health. I'm about to give you something new. Everything that Satan just said that was supposed to break you down was only meant to expose where you're lacking. And then you can see me do my thing in making sure that you are lacking nothing. So everything here was a representation of the corruptness of Israel. And guess what? You're right. I can fix that, though. See, listen, everything that Satan says here doesn't mean, like, you're wrong, Satan. No, he, Satan is right here in so many areas. He's just wrong about the idea that they're done. He's just wrong about the idea that they're going to walk in their own righteousness. How dare you let them walk in their righteousness? God says, no, I'm about to strip their righteousness off of them and place upon them my righteousness. That's the beauty of this. Joshua was thrown before the court to be thrown in a pit, and yet God was saying, nope, this is promotion time. I'm cleaning some things up in you, and I'm using Satan to usher you here to expose that you need a makeover. That's it. That's it. That's, that's all. The, the, the 70 years of captivity didn't purify the people. No, no, they didn't do it. They, they, you know, they, they, they came back and they settled into, the, you know, doing their own thing. They're in a place right now where they're looking and saying, is this the time for us to build? Maybe, maybe this isn't the time for us to build. That's what they said in Haggai. And yet, all of these things that are there, you know, with, with the robes that are going on, all these things that are there, God said, I can wash those garments. They can be made white. Though your sin be as scarlet, you shall be clothed with white. So when you begin to look at this, these filthy garments, this, this sensuality, this whirlingness, all the things that are just attached to ministers of the gospel. Ministers who are trying their best to do what's right, and yet still these things, this, this, these falsehoods, the idolatry, you know, uh, lust, and all the things that still attach to humanity. It's, it's there. It, you know, parents, you know, still, the, the, this is the work of the intercessor in, in, this, in this world. The intercessor is going to bear. Their garments are sometimes are dirty, not simply because of things that they've done, but who they represent. They bear the weight. Parents bear the weight of their children, their, you know, their wayward children. And people will accuse them of things. You know, listen, if you were all that, then why, why, how come your daughter's not? And if you all that, how come your son is not? And you're not still married, and, and you, your relationship didn't work out, and you, it's your third husband. So how can you tell me? Yeah, there's all kinds of accusations where people will want to dirty you up. Ministers, the pastors, and leaders will, will take accusations for 
their people, for the congregation. You know, leaders that are in the world right now, sovereign leaders, presidents will take accusations for things that their people have done. So when you begin to look at this, this is God saying, this is how the inter intercessory prayer works. This is what the intercessors and the prophets in this in our world look like. They are dirty by their own life, but they're also filthy and dirty by the sins of the people that they have to represent, that they go before. And this is God saying they bear the imperfections of people. You know, that's, that's part of what happens here. But guess what? We don't walk in our righteousness. As we get to this point where all the dirt of the world has settled on us, and it just looks like there's nothing we can do. We understand something. God simply imputes righteousness to us. How can you, like, wear, I don't see any new clothes. You know what I mean? Joshua did what he did. The people did what they did. And God was like, I'm imputing righteousness to him. Take a look at him now. And like instantly, because God speaks it, because he says it, because he says what he says about Joshua, instantly, Joshua's garments are changed in front of Satan. Joshua's garments are going to be changed right in front of the adversary. Listen, I need you to get that because I want you to understand something. God is doing some things in front of people right now. I want you to get that. I mean, it, you know, it seems like sheer stupidity. And, and it really is. I mean, like, I mean, if I can, if I come before God, God is simply saying, you don't have to come before me in, in, in your righteousness. I want to clothe you in my righteousness. Don't come before me because you were doing all you know how to do. I'm praying all I know how to pray. You are not. I'm doing all everything I know how to do to live holy. No, 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 you're not. No, you're not. Lord, I'm thinking right and I'm loving people. And no, you're not. You think you are, but you're not. This is God coming and saying, if Satan were to go through your record and he's going through it every single day. I mean, if he was to go through the stuff you idly said and the things that you, you know, that you just, you know, let slip out your mouth, you know, and uh, you, and all that stuff. And then you just kind of went back to your regular day and got back to your holy self and, you know, forgot that you, you know, cursed those people out in the road. Forgot that you were thinking I could just kill them right now. All those things that you just kind of tuck under the, you know, the rug and say, I'm just human. Those are things that will stain your garment. And you don't have a right to come before God thinking you've got it together. This is what Satan comes and says, Joshua, tell him. Joshua doesn't say a word. <laughs> tell, what do you think about yourself? Joshua doesn't say a word. Joshua here is not speaking. Isn't it amazing here that you've got to just stand and let God do it? Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. This court case was supposed to be his imprisonment. This was supposed to be his banishment. This was supposed to be his demotion. And the Lord says, just stand still, Joshua. Don't say anything. You need to defend yourself. You already have a lawyer. Same as Jesus. He's the best lawyer in the business. And, and, and he's my son. So, you know, we got this connection here. So, I mean, it's, you, the, the, the fix is already in. You know, the not guilty plea was already set in motion before Satan accused you. He just had to do his thing so I could show off in front of him. Because I wanted the verdict to be a slap in his face. I wanted him to compile all this evidence year after year against you and to get slapped in the face with imputed righteousness. I just gave it to you. I just gave it to you. The sentencing guidelines are zero to 100 years for this case. All right? Zero. Can, you can't do that, Your Honor. Yes, I can. I'm God. Listen, when God is willing to accept you in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, it's folly to try to present yourself to God in your own righteousness. I want you to grab that. I want you to really get that because I'm going to end this Bible study right here. Do not try. Don't look at your... See what J Joshua saw. I'm a minister of God walking around with filthy garments. But it's not, I don't have it all together. I, I, I still have work to do. I'm not where I need to be. But my thanks is that I see what Satan sees. I do. I see it. You know, when our eyes are open, this was the love of God. This is why Zechariah gets this message. This message was not a message of rebuke. This was a message of love. He's after you. I'm protecting you. I'm going to give you an expected end. I'm going to make sure you end up clean. As impossible as it is, man, unto him that is able to present us faultless. Man, that's who we glorify. Somehow, he's going to present us to God without spot or blemish. And that can't come from what you're wearing right now. That can't come from the soap you're using right now. That can't come from the toothpaste you're using right now. There's nothing we have that can cleanse ourselves. We have to go before God with these filthy robes on 
still ministering, still praying, still standing. Don't demote yourself. Don't leave your spot. You got to continue to stand as the high priest with every accusation against you and realize that somehow when I get before the Lord, I can stand before him, not based on my righteousness, but on this imputed righteousness where he says, you came here to change clothes. That's why we're in his presence, to change clothes. Joshua was in his presence to change clothes. Zechariah was getting this vision because God was saying, I'm about to change the clothes of Israel. Don't give up hope. With what you see going on out there, I'm about to change the clothes of the church. Don't give up hope. It's not over. You know, upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell should not prevail against it. Listen, do not give up on God's church because the same uh, Satan, that, that you, Satan that you saw here is the same Satan that's accusing the church right now. This institution is dead. The church is done. You know, I mean, who wants to be a part of the church anymore? Listen, let me tell you something right now. You can't kill God's church. You can't destroy the church. There are all manner of cultural or social changes. It may not happen in the way it would happen before where they used to do it in caves, then they did it in houses, and now they're doing it in buildings and warehouses and, you know, uh, floor shops that are converted into churches. I, we don't know what the future holds there, but I can tell you right now, the gospel is going to be preached until the kingdom comes. God is going to have ministers, and the fact that he gave fivefold ministry, they don't stop because we want it to stop. They don't stop because Satan accuses. They don't stop because people get highfalutin. It doesn't stop until Jesus cracks the sky. So listen, with what you got going on, with whatever is happening in your life, I need you right now to recognize that God is changing your garments right in front of Satan, right in front of you. While everybody's <coughs> watching, he's changing your garments. So listen, I want you to receive that today. Listen, this is the end of our Bible study. My hope is that this was a blessing to you. Uh, and listen, I want you to make sure that don't forget to share. You know, we are here. We're doing some, you know, doing some really, really good things here. And I think, you know, we've got this Past the Noise podcast that we have every Wednesday at 7 o'clock. I want you to really tune in there. We're there on our Facebook page. We've got, uh, we, you're going to see us on Instagram. You'll be able to see us on YouTube as well. You know, we're really going to be on all platforms because I, this is going to be a forum. To where, you, again, you get to interact and you get to talk. So I want you to jump on board and, and become a part of this. We have this interactive Bible study every Thursday. We're here every Wednesday at 5 o'clock for our Live at 5. So we're going to be here bombarding the areas of social media, all platforms, to make sure the gospel is being preached. We're out here in the world. We're out here in the streets preaching the gospel, making sure that outreach is being done. But I want to make sure that in these venues that the word of God is being preached. And we have this opportunity to spread it. So as we spread it through the Pastor Noise podcast on Wednesdays at 7, as we spread this thing, you know, through our, our Bible study here every Thursday at 7.30, you know, as we look at Wednesday at 5 o'clock, we're at live at 5, and come back here Sunday at 12. The word is here. We need you to help. We need your help to make sure that we share it. Let's get this out here. Because if you're blessed by this word, make sure somebody else gets has, has an opportunity to be blessed by this word as well. Listen, I hope that you have an awesome uh, Thursday. Don't hesitate to share Put this on any platform that you desire because we want people to be blessed. We want the great changing of the garments to happen in our lifetime. Listen, God bless you and have an awesome Thursday.